I don't know if it's too optimistic to open all the doors already. We haven't even, we don't even know if it works, but... Let's find out. Hello guys, welcome back to TSBEC TV and welcome back to our new Discovery 2. Last time we revealed the LOF Extreme Spec Clutch that we're going to be fitting to it along with a brand new gearbox because the one that is in it currently is not working as it should. So over the next couple of days, we're going to be replacing the gearbox clutch and flywheel and doing a whole bunch of other servicing type stuff to it. So what we're going to do now first is head into the garage and show you all of the bits we've got lined up to fit to this Discovery 2 to make, get it back on the road over the next couple of days. So uh, what we got here is pretty much all the parts we're gonna need for the next, hopefully two days, a rebuild of the gearbox. So it's not rebuild, it's pretty much a swap for the gearbox and clutch. Uh, when you do the gearbox, you are pretty much stupid if you don't do the clutch as well, because the gearbox is a bit of a pain in the butt to take out if you don't have the, uh, the right equipment for it. But if we start over here, we got the clutch from uh, LOF Clutches, which we already did a video on, uh, which comes in the kit and what you actually need for it. And uh, got the dual uh, flywheel as well, which is brand new. You don't need to change that, uh, but if you open it up and figure out the damper is completely shut, you need to change it anyway. So we got one because we do not know the state of the vehicle. Then we got loads of service parts here. Uh, I don't think we're going to use all of them, there's just some of them that arrived. Uh, I don't know which one is for which, but we'll probably figure that out which one goes onto the Ford and what goes onto the Disco. So on this side, we got the new gearbox mounts as well, might as well change those. While we are at it, these small things here, uh, brand new ones as well. And they're just gonna, if they're already broken, you might as well have a pair at hand and swap those out. Then we got the input shaft seal for the transfer case, you want to change that as well. And if you did not know what I watched the first video, the rear hinges on the tailgate is also completely shut. So I got one hinge for it, the other one is on the way. So that one, if we got time for it, I want to swap that one out as well. Uh, and then we got some more small gearbox parts here. And we got a O-ring seal somewhere as well for the power steering, uh, which we also want to swap out because it's leaking a bit. I might as well do that now. And then, of course, we've got the main prize, which we're going to open right now. Uh, I contacted uh, Ashcroft and asked for a gearbox from them. Uh, if Synchro Gearboxes were still making gearboxes, uh, which he did before, I probably got one of those. But he only makes uh, high-end transfer cases right now because he's busy doing racing and stuff. Uh, so I got off uh, Ashcroft gearboxes. Uh, I got the bigger bearings from the input and output shaft, which should they uh, work quite well with towing and the uh, stage 3 tune which I'm going after. Uh, and then also got a higher ratio 5th gear, which should also make a big difference on the fuel economy going on the highway, which I will mainly use this car for. Uh, so those are the two up upgrades on the gearbox. Uh, and they do sell them at a pretty good price. They check over the gearboxes they get in, replace all the parts which does not fit within manual standards. Um, and it is on an exchange basis, so you get one gearbox, then you ship your own gearbox back to them, uh, unless you're gonna lose 350 pounds, I think it is, uh, if you don't do it. And if you don't ship it within the next year or 360 days, that price is gonna go down, so you're gonna get even less for your gearbox. Uh, so we're pretty much just gonna take this gearbox out, swap it in and take the old one, wash it and put it back. I'm gonna ship it this week as well, just so it's out of this, uh, this world and I can get my money back for it. So, this is the first time we've seen it as well. Oh, nice. There he is. Now, on the package, it says it weighs about 56 kilos as well. Uh, so, it's quite heavy. Uh, and if you take the transfer case as well, it's about 70 kilos in total. We need to get out of the vehicle. Uh, so we got a hoist for that as well. well yeah, this looks pretty much new, I would say. So yeah, it can maybe, I don't think you can see it, but it should be 
The bearings in here should be the bigger ones that they produce themselves, which can take a lot more force. And then goes on the other side here uh, from that bear. And there's a complete manual on what you need to let stay on the rear of the gearbox when you ship it back, uh, just so you don't, you know, ship it with your reverse light switch or anything like that. So they come like a complete formula of what the gearbox needs to look like before you ship it back to them. But yeah, this is what we're going to be doing the next two days. Uh, so now we're going to take all this stuff, move it into the sides and get the... Oh! One last thing. I found a name for the, for the disco as well. I got some stickers for it as well. And the sticker is... Ta-da! It's going to be called the, the TIE Fighter. Disco the TIE Fighter, because like completely all blacked out. I thought that would be pretty cool. So these ones will go on in the end. And the TIE Fighter will yet again be ready for battle. Uh, but yeah, we're gonna move all the parts out of the way now. We're gonna take the car, drive it in, put it on the lift and start taking parts or things apart. And hopefully make it through the day. So the first stage of this swap is going to be uh, disconnect the gear lever, which is held in by one bolt. On this bit you just pull up the gator with some uh, clips here, you see I need to get a new one of these as well. Uh, Exmar Trim makes these actually, for this one, this one and this one. So anyway, you're gonna unclip this one, undo that one bolt, and that's actually the only thing that's keeping the main gearbox connected to the inside of the vehicle. Uh, then we've got the starter motor, we've got the uh, crank angle sensor, I think it's called. Uh, of course, we also got the cable for this guy here and the handbrake as well. Uh, but we don't need to disconnect them up here, we can do that down on the gearbox. The only bit is this guy. Remove that bit and you've got a lot less trouble later on. Uh, so disconnect that one and because we're going to do loads of stuff on the starter motor, we're going to disconnect the battery as well so we don't mess up any kind of sensors or, or if a positive or positive hit each other, the starter motor goes crazy or something. So that's one off, disconnect the battery get the vehicle up and then just start stripping pretty much everything that's within the gearbox uh, connected to it which means both prop shaft, handbrake, the cross member, exhaust, yeah all those parts need to go out uh, and hopefully within today we should have the gearbox out on the floor and maybe also the clutch and maybe install the new clutch uh, but at least we need to get everything out today and then we'll assemble everything tomorrow and take it for a test drive uh, so that is the plan so yeah we should get started with that. When I got the car, I was hoping that it would kind of loop up everything inside the gearbox because it was missing a lot of oil. So I replaced the oil and drove it around the woods, probably was at 10, 15 kilometers. And after that, this is what I've gathered inside the main gearbox. Uh, so Liam just pulled the plug and this is what it looks like. Uh, and I completely cleaned it, you know, 15, 20 kilometers ago. Uh, so something is definitely wrong inside that gearbox and I think it's the oil pump that have been starved and then just started to eat itself up. Uh, so yeah, that is why we're doing this. Uh, we pulled the other ones, the rear diff looks quite nice in the oil, front diffs is very black and haven't been changed in a long time so that's really good we're doing that. Uh, transfer case looks okay, you know, you really can't kill a good transfer case, uh, it takes a lot of effort to do and this one has only been going on road, uh, only if it's been very slippery you might kill it. but. Uh, so now we're doing the engine just before we go in for lunch, so I think it just drip off while we're in there eating. Uh, and I changed all, I changed the, both the gearboxes, oil, uh, I haven't done the divs, and now we're doing the engines, and I haven't had a look at the engines yet. So we're just going to pour it into this bucket, and we've got a small uh, uh, glass here, plastic cup. We're going to put some oil in and just have a look, see what the state of the engine oil is, because I can actually tell a lot about the engine's life. 
uh, how it had been treated. Uh, but from what I heard from the owner who had it, was that the previous owners were two father and sons who were both into Land Rovers and mechanics. So I'm feeling lucky a bit to see what it's looked like. Here it comes. Sample here. Oh, that smells bad. <laughs> it's in your bed now as well. Is it? Mm -hmm. oh, I'm part of the car now. So we just emptied out. We had a bit of lunch while the engine dripped off in the gearbox as well. Uh, and this is in the oil that came out of the engine. Uh, at first in inspection, pretty much all diesel engines have got black oil after about 10,000 kilometers. That's just what happens. But it's very liquid compared to that it's supposed to be oil. A bit of bit out here. It's quite liquid uh, compared to what it should be, uh, but I don't smell any sort of diesel or anything that could point in the way that it should be an injector seal or bad piston rings or anything. It doesn't really smell of that much. It just looks like you're smelling a fine wine. Mm. Uh, I don't think there's any water in it because then we should also be able to see it because water and oil doesn't mix, so it should be water on top. Uh, so all in all, I would say there's a pretty good engine oil, but it is about time it gets changed because it's not very uh, oily. Oily, yeah. <laughs> but I did also put some uh, oil release thing in to kind of clean up the whole engine, so that might also be a bit wise, not as oily as it should be. But yeah, looks healthy. No metal uh, splinters or anything really uh, from what we could see. So that is good. Uh, next up, clean all this stuff up. Take the other. Uh, Drive shaft out, or not the drive shaft, what's it called? Half shaft? No. Yeah, drive shaft. This is a drive shaft, prop shaft. Uh, take that out. Uh, and we got an extra hand now as well. Uh, the third cousin has arrived, and he will start assembling the lift or the hoist for the gearbox and transfer box to get those out as well. And then I'll just start taking the exhaust and all that boring stuff out of the way as well. Uh, so today, as I said before, hopefully gearbox should be out of the car. Uh, so that's what we're working against. So now we pretty much got all the plugs in again. Uh, now the next bit is disconnect the linkage, which is right up here for the high-low range. Uh, that should be just a couple of clips and take it off. Uh, and then we need to get the starter motor and the crank angle sensor, I think it was called. Uh, that just gets unplugged. Uh, and yeah, that's pretty much all unplugging that has to be done. There are a couple of brief breather hoses as well, but they're quite easy to get off. You can just lower the gearbox a bit down and take them off because they're very flexible as well. Uh, so that is the next job on the list. We have now gotten to the part where we're actually going to release the bolts holding the gearbox in. Uh, we're just taking five bolts out that we could find from the bell housing. Uh, I think I read there should be some on top as well. It's going to be a pain in the butt to reach. Uh, so what we're going to do now is actually slagging the bolts here on the actual gearbox mounts. Uh, and then going to lower it down a bit so you can get a bit of an angle without destroying the engine mounts and get from this angle in and get the last uh, top one to hold the belt housing in. After that we slide the whole bit, tiny bit rear and then we can take it down. It was right here we found ourselves in a rather awkward situation. The bell housing effectively became wedged on the bottom of the Discovery. Despite the car lift being as high as it could go and the gearbox stand being as low as it could go. This meant we had no choice but to manually carry the bell housing, gearbox and transfer box down to the ground. We are now at end of day one and we reached our goal. We got the gearbox out and the transfer case and the bell housing all in one go. Uh, I would uh, recommend in the future taking the transfer case off first uh, if you are not three persons, if you're only two persons uh, because it is very, very, very heavy and not very forgiving when taken out. To do that, we got it out with uh, no damage whatsoever. Uh, and here are all the parts we took out. First of all, so first of all we have to take the uh, dry shafts here, the uh, prop shafts out which came out with no problem whatsoever. I haven't found any dead joints yet, so they are still looked after. We're gonna replace this rubber thing here tomorrow. Got a new one of those. Uh, we got the handbrake off and the shoes. They are a bit problematic with the springs getting those off, but they are reusable. Uh, and the brakes also look in good condition, not rusty or anything. Or a bit, but not too much. We got the two cross members off. Uh, we tried to take some of the nuts off, but it just kept spinning around. So what I did 
is I went to get a uh, an, uh, an inch top instead of a millimeter top. And then just press that over it and hammer it on, and that way I could get it off without breaking it. Uh, because it was just spinning as I said. So we got all of those off without breaking any, which I'm really happy about. Uh, the only thing that did break was on the down pipe. One of the studs that sits into the turbo uh, hot side, that broke off, but it broke off. So we still got about, I would say, two to three millimeters to work with. Uh, so tomorrow I'm gonna have a look and see if I can get it from underneath, or if I have to take the turbo out, and then on, take that tiny stud out and put a new one in. I might just replace all of them. Uh, and that's pretty much the only damage we have had today. Uh, I'm really happy about that uh, because that is a replaceable part uh, whatsoever. But yeah, then we also had to take the starter motor out, which is on the table over there. And uh, we found out getting underneath with the extension and a 15 millimeter for the top bolt. And just grabbing it from underneath and driving it on. That way was the easiest way to do it. We've done it once before, but we completely forgot how to do it. We did one person on top and one yeah, sounds weird, but one person on top, one underneath, and guiding each other onto the nut. <laughs> uh, and then we also found out that the hoist is a bit too high compared to the car, so we have to figure something out. Uh, I think when we put it back in, we're gonna do it the gearbox and bell housing first, and then the transfer case in the end, and bolt that on, because then all the bolts are also completely new, and they won't seize up or anything. Uh, so tomorrow, start off doing the clutch, the loaf clutch, uh, doing complete clutch change and the sump, need to drop that tiny bit to get the uh, rear oil seal out. And after that we'll look into the gearbox, connecting all of that, getting that up and then pretty much assemble all the rest of the stuff. Uh, meanwhile I'm going to have a look at the turbo and see if I can fix that up somewhere in between. So, we got pretty far, with best of luck and everybody on our side, we will be done tomorrow. But Maybe not. Maybe we are we at least going to get the gearbox in tomorrow, connect it all up. Uh, and then we might need some tiny bits and pieces I can do by myself. Uh, you pretty much already know how to do it. Uh, so yeah. But I'm happy. Are you happy? Are you dirty? Me too. Day two, uh, we had a bit of a rough start. We tried to get the stud out of the turbo, but did not succeed. So after we've done all this, I have to get the turbo out before we can fit the downpipe to get the three new studs in there. But yesterday we got pretty far. The gearbox right now is up, getting a nice wash. Uh, I took the clutch out yesterday, which we can have a quick look at. The clutch itself doesn't look too bad. Uh, still got loads of fibers in it to be uh, to be used. Uh, but if you look. On uh, this side, you can see how much scorched it is because somebody has been filing on the clutch and doing something they should not have the clutch, uh, which then leaves all these scorch marks around it, which is not very good. Uh, if you turn around here, you can see where the release bearing has gone in near these fins here, the springs, uh, and you can just feel clearly feel the groove in here that should not be there. Uh, and the flywheel as well is fitted right now on here with one bolt. Uh, pretty much same story. Uh, the Dumas flywheel got two sets of springs in it, and if you push it down, you can pretty much move it with your hands, which you're not supposed to do because it's the engine supposed to do that, not by hand. Uh, the good thing we got a new one of those as well. Uh, next job right now is take the flywheel off and replace the rear crank oil seal, uh, where we have to take the sump a tiny bit down. Uh, remove it, put the new one on, tighten the sump back up, and then it is a flywheel and the other two clutch components. And that is pretty much the only thing you need to do with the clutch. And the spigot bearing as well, we have to remove that. 
Uh, we'll probably just start doing that right now. Right, while that's all going on, I'm going to go and fetch the gator to go and put the gearbox in the, the old gearbox in the back of it so that we can take it to be washed before it is sent off back to Ashcroft. So here we've got the spigot bearing, uh, also came in the kit, uh, with the clutch kit. Uh, I got this magnificent tool to remove it, which is a inner bearing puller, I think it's called. Uh, and I found out that the 20 millimeter one works. Similarly, what you do is the spigot bearing sits in the crank, the rear of the crank. You push this bit in, you twist it, and that way it will make itself bigger, just so the lips here can go in and grab hold of the bearing. Oh tiny bit more. Then once it is like this, you then take the impact hammer and you just simply pull it out. Uh, that's one way of doing it, the proper way which says in the, in the manual. You can also pack it up with grease, uh, the inner circle of the uh, spigot bearing here, pack it all up with grease and then get a rod that's just exactly the same diameter as the spigot bearing, then you just hit with a hammer. That way the grease gets behind the spigot bearing and start pushing it out. So you simply just hit it and you put more grease, hit it, more grease, hit it, and in the end it will pop out. Uh, I've also seen people do it with bread, uh, so that is also possible to do. But we're actually going to use this kit for the proper job right now. Uh, so pull that out, put the new one in, and then do the rear oil the crank seal. So right now we're going to replace, <laughs> replace the rear crank oil seal. we got the old one here. Uh, pretty much uh, exactly the same, except this one got this... Uh, rubber plastic thing in it and that's actually to guide the the gasket over it uh, to not to break it while you put it on. So you can just line it up where it should be and I'm just gonna push it on. Well you've got two locking tabs at the bottom as well we need to make sure that runs clear while we do this. There you go. That falls off. Make sure the sump goes in. It goes into these locking tabs. So that just took about five minutes longer because Land Rover have chosen to hit or hide one bolt away from the uh, sump, which is at the right front. If you look at that way, it's the left corner, the right left front left corner. That's a tiny one which is just hidden under loads of hoses and stuff. Uh, you're gonna have a real hard time seeing it and even harder time getting it uh, released a bit. But we did that, we got the locking tabs fitted. Uh, I'm probably gonna get a new sump, uh, new, uh, sump gasket at some point after this job, but uh, it should keep up uh, for now. The most important thing is that we change this thing. Uh, because we won't be able to change that once we put the gearbox in without taking that out. But you can always take the sump off without taking the gearbox off. So rather that one goes and this one up here. So that's a, a job nice done. Now we just need to tighten these ones up. I have to look up how many newton meter that is. Uh, and then put up the sump again. Tighten those to the correct newton meters and then we'll move back the gearbox. So here we've got the clutch fork from the R380 gearbox. Uh, a lot of you guys also said, why didn't you also get a new uh, clutch fork? Uh, that's because the only weak ones are in the 200 TDI and LT77. And that is because this is one huge chunk of metal, uh, where the other ones are just sheet metal made. Which actually means that this bit here is going to be poking out from the middle bit at some point. Uh, the pivot point are going to go through and that way you're going to lose it. But using this one, you'll need to replace this little cup in here, which also supplies in the kit from the clutch. So you simply just take that one out and put the new one in, of course, clean it all up. Uh, and then we're gonna put this bit in and then we got the release bearings here, which are also very interesting. This is the heavy duty release bearing from loaf clutches. As you can see, the standard one is plastic. And yeah, they got the bearing inside here in the middle. Uh, but if you prefer just the extreme kit, I just choose to have this one with it. You can see this one is 
a hell of a lot beefier and it's complete complete metal uh, also in the back bit here and you get everything you need you get the release bearing you get the extra bigger clip to clip it onto the fork and everything uh, so I can't can't wait to put this one on uh, it's not because it's gonna make your clutch heavy heavy or anything it's just more durable when it's bigger the only thing this one does is slide in and out on the shaft nothing else uh, so we're gonna put this one on now and also the new rod here uh, and after that we will actually install the flywheel and the clutch components so i think that will be the last thing we we can do today and we have to wait with the gearbox for tomorrow uh, that just means we get extra busy tomorrow but we've got plans here this evening uh, so we're going to go over and do that right now so we are back now on the third day and hopefully we should get the clutch and gearbox in today Yesterday we got the whole first assembly ready to go into the gearbox and last night I did some a bit more fiddling uh, I got the transfer case separated from the old gearbox Got the reverse light switch uh, Got the engine or the gearbox mounts uh, put in the new ones as well And did some smaller jobs on the car and the new rubber cushion here On the shaft as well uh, And the bearing in the middle uh, Pulled that out, put the new one in and put this Probably, and it was quite used the old one, so it's a good thing we got a new one of those. Uh, so now, from the start, we're going to put the new uh, flywheel in. We're just going to have a look at the new and the old one, what to look after on your old one, uh, and why you know, well, when you know it's time to replace uh, if you're doing a, a gearbox change like we are. Uh, so over here we got the old one and on the ground right here. And the first giveaway is all these scorch marks that are on it, which means that. Previous owner has been filing on the clutch, which then makes these marks come out. And another thing is that it's not very springy or anything like that. I can push it down and actually pull the springs down quite a bit. Uh, it's not supposed to have that much play in it. Otherwise, you have to look around the roots here if there are any sort of cracks from going out because it's quite thin. Yeah. <coughs> On this time, on this side, there really isn't that much. Again, so have a look at. But you can see these Welsh, Welsh plugs. If there are any cracks going into the middle bit, uh, but yeah, there's a lot of play in it. So over here we've got the new one. We've got the instructions coming from uh, LOF from Luke, telling us how to do it. Ta -da! There he is, looking brand new. We haven't got as much play in it, and I. Really twist it much more uh, than that. So this guy is gonna go on after we degrease him uh, and do the 40 Nm meters and 9 degree turn. And the last one was at 180 Nm. So we're gonna do that. So here we got the transfer case I pulled off yesterday. Uh, yesterday night, actually it was today. Uh, pulled it out fairly easily. Changed the seal in here. Which is really easy to pop it out, put a new one in, so not to damage anything inside of it. Had a look at the splines into the input shaft, they look really good, absolutely no way on them whatsoever. Uh, had a look at the number as well on the gearbox, which is on this side, I think, down here, uh, where it says 41D, uh, which means that this one is the older uh, LT230, which means it also has the Transfer of the central differen differential locking inside of it so we can actually just fit the linkage to it and we will be able to lock the diff as well. Uh, you can go into Ashcroft's uh, website and you can have a look and see what kind of numbers you need to have to have the, the transfer box with the locking differential inside of it already because they took it out further down the road because they got the uh, traction control and ABS locking and all that. Uh, but this one does have it. So what we've got here are the new uh, flywheel bolts. The bolts onto the rear crank of the engine. Here we've got the old one and here we've got the new one. You need to replace these. Uh, these are stretch bolts. And you can see if I compare them up to each other, this one is actually a tiny bit longer than the top one. And these should be completely the same. Uh, and that is the only thing you need to replace uh, when doing it and be aware of that. Uh, you cannot reuse them. So we just moved out here in the back because they are hitting uh, metal things in there and they, that is quite noisy. Uh, so in the kit you also get Loctite and this syringe so you can actually feel like a doctor doing surgery on your, on your vehicle. 
Uh, although you do need the stretch bolts, which got I got these one from Bearmark. They are Echo Romeo Romeo six five eight one. Uh, they are just completely standard bolts. Nothing really cool about that. Uh, so you take the bolts, you apply Loctite on them from the syringe, and then just put them in, do them all up. But if you remember, an engine that turns quite easily uh, actually when you're using force. So we have made a locking tool to hold the engine in place. But Luke uh, from Loaf Crutches also just did the locking tool, which is about 30 pounds or so cheaper than what I could find uh, from like some universal locking tool, flywheel locking tool. Uh, so if you're gonna get the kit, you might as well get one of those with it. It's gonna make your life a lot easier if you haven't got any sort of metal laying about in a welder that you can make your own with. But we're gonna show you two different methods right now uh, where you make your own locking tool and one way you can actually use a pry bar to kind of lock it in place through that as possible as well. But you want to be two persons to do the pry bar uh, way. So we're gonna go back inside now. I think they're done hammering uh, and apply the new flywheel onto the engine. So the first way you can do it if you're two persons and you're a bit in a hurry, you can put in one of the bolts for the bell housing to your crowbar. Stick that in here, and then until you hit one of the, these uh, notches onto the flywheel, and that way you can keep it. Oh, I'm gonna sneeze. <laughs> Alright, we're back. Put that one in here. Uh, of course, when you tighten them, it's gonna pull out that way around. So I want a bit of an angle onto it, and it's pulling back down. That's one way to do it, but we went ahead and made a tool for that, so we're gonna put that on right now and see if it actually works. The locking tool is quite simply made. It's just a piece of uh, two pieces of iron I cut out. Uh, used a cardboard box, or like a bit of the side of it, to poke the two holes in it. One screwdriver in there, one screwdriver in there. Took it out and then transferred it onto the middle bit. Built two holes in it and made it so I can slide it back and forth, so I can slide it into the slot here. Uh, and then I got this bit welded on, bit of an angle again. We're pulling it downwards when you're tightening it. That way you're going to lock it. Uh, and the loaf clutches one, you actually got two ones. So both if you're doing that way or that way, it, uh, it will be locked. Uh, but we only need to tighten it right now, so we're doing it that way. Because we can add it to take them out again. So here we got the extreme spec uh, clutch uh, fiber side of the fiber disc. Uh, on this, you can see it says clearly right here. Gearbox side, so you know which side goes into what. Uh, and to align this bit up, you need an alignment tool, which Luke also sells. I think it's actually included in some of the the kits. So you take this bit, push it through. This bit go into the spigot bearing right at the end of the gearbox. And once you put this one in, you can then put the spring assembly onto the back of it. Well, as you can see, I touched it with some quite dirty gloves. Don't do that. Switch over to some brand new gloves. That way you won't contaminate it. I'm gonna start slipping. Yeah. So remember that. Don't be stupid like me. There you go. Turn it the right way around. It's gonna help as well. So there you go. Now this is completely centered within the plate here. And then you're gonna take the spring assembly, degrease that on this surface here, which is gonna press against that bit. And after that, we're going to put it on and use the uh, bolts that come with the kit, which also uh, captive our, our nylon locking tools or nuts, uh, and put those on. So while you're putting in the new uh, spring plate and doing up the bolts, just do up some of them in a crisscross pattern, as always. And then just make sure that the alignment pin goes freely in and out onto the spigot bearing and onto the fiber disc. Uh, because if not, and you're going to mount your gearbox, you're going to have a really hard time aligning that straight uh, uh, input shaft through both of those holes. Uh, so it's going to make sure that once you put it in, do a tiny bit back and forth, see it goes into the spigot bearing as well. Uh, although this one is made of plastic, this alignment tool, which means if you put it into the spigot bearing like that, you're going to have a hard time trying to get it out because of course it pushes out all the, all the air and uh, got a hard time getting out to so just wiggle it a tiny bit. You can get it out like that. And then you can just see it goes freely and then out. Which is what you want. Alright, 
So now the hardest part is over, which is taking the gearbox and the bill housing and bolting that onto the engine and getting the, the splines on the shaft to match both the, the friction plate uh, or the fiber plate and as well in through the spigot bearing in the back. Uh, so what we did first of all is just took it up, tried to get it in, but there are two small taps which holds a coolant hose right on the back of the engine. Uh, so we went, took the engine, uh, the gearbox down again, and then we took the taps and pointed them upwards. Of that, we took the engine on again, and we nearly got it all the way, but we couldn't get the last bit by pushing it. So we then went ahead and put two bolts in, and they just about grabbed the thread. And we wiggled it at the same time if we tightened them a bit, and then we just did that all the way around, just a tiny bit each bolt, and then, then just completely got together. Uh, a good tip is putting it into a gear before you do it, although you can also do it right now There's plenty of space to, to swap the gears or change gears uh, Because that way you can turn the rear output shaft so that the splines on the front Input shaft then align up with the clutch. You take that and turn it slowly around and all of a sudden it jumps in and the splines uh, uh, Adapt or match together uh, otherwise than that, it was just a three-man, four-man job really, <laughs> but we put it in now. Uh, so what we're going to do is do uh, some breather hoses here for the oil. Going to attach that, uh, and after we attach the breather hose, we need to do the reverse light switch well, as well. So the gearbox knows when you are selecting reverse, the rear lights need to come on. Uh, and I've already taken, as I said earlier, the reverse switch from the old gearbox into the new gearbox. Uh, so that's pretty much just plug and play. And all the plugs are only like one of each, so they can only go in one way. Although there are two plugs which can go each side uh, onto two things that point upwards. Uh, so we have to kind of test it, see if they can go any way around. I did take a picture of it, but all the wires were completely covered in oil, so I can't see the color of them. Uh, but we're gonna try and have a look and see if I can identify which one goes where. Otherwise than that, it is probably starter motor and the uh, uh, slave cylinder on. After that, we're gonna go to the transfer case and lift that up onto it. Actually, we're gonna do that first. We might as well get the engine mounts on or the gearbox mounts. So first now is the transfer case. Get that lift up on the hoist uh, and connect to that and do all the bolts on it and get the mounts onto it. And after that, it's just all the auxiliaries around it. Then the engine and gearbox is complete. Uh, so that's gonna be our next job for you. So, welcome back. It's been a time uh, since you last saw us record anything. Uh, but if you look above you, the gearbox, transfer box, and the shafts are now in place together with the handbrake. Uh, and we've topped both of the gearboxes up with oil, uh, recommended oil from Land Rover. And yeah, what a day. I'm pretty tired. <laughs> so. The only real thing we need to do now is, as you can see, we're missing a part of the exhaust here, which is the downpipe, which where the stud broke by the turbo up there. We fixed that this morning, uh, and I've put in a new bolt from the top down, so we can put a nut on the other side. Uh, but to get a proper sealant, we need to get some liquid exhaust sealant uh, that we can smear around the edges on the on the downpipe and the turbo itself to get a proper good connection. We don't get any fumes anything leaking out uh, so I'll be going up getting that tomorrow morning uh, we'll be fitting the downpipe and tonight I'll probably be doing the power steering getting all the new uh, uh, the gaskets in that one and otherwise than that we just need to change two filters put some oil in them and he hopefully will move under his own power again uh, so that is the plan uh, yeah I guess I will see you tomorrow then So here we are at the fourth and final day of this gearbox swap. Uh, we could probably have done it in two and a half days, but you still have some family and places to eat and stuff. Uh, so that's the reason why. Yesterday I changed both the oil filters and put fresh oil in it. Uh, still need to swap the diesel filter. We need to get the exhaust on and we need to uh, bleed the, the clutch pedal. So that seems rather light. Uh, for the exhaust, I went up this morning and got some of this exhaust paste thing. Uh, you do not want to reuse these, but, but we are. Don't be like us. I haven't got a spare one. I thought we had one in the workshop. 
I'm going to use this around it just to seal it up. Uh, got two new blades to see if they fit. Don't know, just got some 18 inch ones. Uh, we've got the new fuses over there. Plop that on while they do the exhaust. Go underneath, help two men on the exhaust, and then do the bleed of the, the clutch pedal, and we should be ready to go. So I think it's fair to say that the fuel filter was due a change judging by the difference between the old one and the new one right here and also it's important to not forget to remove this water sensor plug thing that goes on the bottom and that is I believe exclusive to the Discovery TD5 um, and maybe it's on later Defenders I'm not sure but it's not on mine at least. But yeah that was about time. Oh. So we're now putting on a bit of this exhaust paste liquid gasket sealer thing which can withstand up to about 2000 degrees. So we should be in the clear. And the reason we do that is because the downpipe is quite rusty so we've got some huge holes in it as well. Uh, and we can't, this gasket can't fill that up. So we're going to put a tiny bit on each side, load up, tighten it and it says uh, if you start it up and let it run for about 20 minutes that will make it uh, hard and quicker. Uh, and that way it should be easier to do. Uh, just make sure you don't get it inside the bolts or not because then it's going to be even more difficult to, to remove in the future. The last piece of the puzzle, the downpipe, was now ready to be installed. However, we quickly realized that there wasn't any room for it, owing to the fact that Nissa had already refitted the struts that go across the chassis, meaning we had to remove the front one again before the downpipe could go back on. But once this was sorted, it was time for the moment of truth. I don't know if it's too optimistic to open all the doors already. I haven't even, we don't even know if it works, but... Let's find out. So we just tried to roll him out, but he did not want to engage gear with the clutch down. The clutch is very, very, very light, uh, especially the top of the, or the top of it. When you pull it down, it kind of grips, but it, when you try to engage a gear, it won't go into it. Uh, we did try and bleed up quite a lot of it actually. Uh, we might just try, might just try and see if it is the slave cylinder. It's wrong. We might do a bit more bleeding and see if that does the job. Otherwise, I'm gone out of ideas, except we have to take it all out again. something that was nice let's get him out can you explain what you did to the viewers yes uh, I read we just went up to have lunch as well uh, and I read on the internet that it this the TD5s are quite a bitch to uh, bleed out the air from uh, so what I did I just hooked up the automatic air bleeder Put that on the nibble, open the valve completely, and just hold on. And I could see through the clear tube when the air bolt was stopped coming. And when he did that, I just tighten it all down. Uh, we tried doing it just by pumping a few times, opening, closing it. But at some point, a lot of air must have gotten into the system uh, because it was pretty much the whole hose we had to go through. Uh, so we did that, and it works. I think we should go out and have a test drive in them. So just before we go out and do a massive burnout in it, uh, this comes with the clutch kit itself, uh, where it says that uh, organic clutches, that's the road spec or the power spec, will require 500 miles of road driving to be bed in. Um, during that time, no harsh throttle uh, openings and excessive spinning of the clutch pedal it should be avoided. But we are going to go down here with the red bit, which you also crossed out here. 
which is the extreme spec clutch which we installed will require 1000 miles to be bed in uh, before we can do any kind of burnouts <laughs> not because I'm going to do any but uh, before we start pulling or slipping the clutch and so on just normal driving about uh, 1000 miles uh, which is quite important you do uh, and down here Correct bedding in both clutch types is vital to its longevity and success. Uh, and here, loads of things you need to go through once you go over there. You can already see I've had my dirty hands on that, so... Read it all through, really nice piece of paper to have. Comes in the clutch kit uh, itself, how to do it. And on their website, it explains how to actually install the, the different kind of uh, bearings and things. Into, into the car, otherwise I've used the uh, Rimmer Bros did a tutorial how to do it, very like uh, just scraping the surface really of what it requires but what kind of, of way or uh, thing you have to do in what order uh, so I actually use that as well, it helped us, helped us quite a lot but it doesn't say anything very specific if you counter this problem and that problem uh, but we managed to do without and we got it driving so we're gonna open up the doors, we can open them up now and uh, take him out into the yard and drive him a bit about. How was the first 200 meters of reversing for the first time the ever? The best reversing I've ever done in my whole life. <laughs> and now it's time for the stickers. Yep. It actually haven't got a, a, a love clutch leg yet. No, 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 it doesn't work until you put no. the sticker on. The sticker it's now it's just, just a standard Land Rover yeah, yeah. clutch. It is. Put the sticker on, then it's an extreme spec clutch. That's when you, like, unlock the power <laughs> of it. <laughs> That's how it works. We're all waiting. Other than four. <laughs> <laughs> wow. How cool is this? I know we just spent four days in the workshop <laughs> so doing amazed. doing everything we did and and I'm still kind of like it actually works. I'm surprised. We did well. I am simultaneously very happy for you but also very jealous of you. <laughs> this is so cool. So cool. So after all of that, we're gonna bring this video to a close here. I have no idea what format it'll be in, whether it'll be one long video or broken up into segments or whatever. Obviously, any of you watching now will know because you will have just seen it, but I have no idea. Uh, all I know is we're going to have a lot of footage to go through after the last four days because it did take us four days. And we were both just saying off of camera, we, we are actually slightly amazed that we actually did this. <laughs> like in terms of workshop mechanical stuff, it's the biggest job we've ever done uh, changing a gearbox um, but we managed to do it um, in our own in our own workshop with the help of uh, a couple of other people at times uh, especially for for lifting things but otherwise I mean we did it it, we did. it was you know, wasn't that that bad um, and it works uh, we've got you've got a, a thousand sensible miles to go now I do. To, bed, to, to bed in the clutch sensible remember that sensible miles to bed in the clutch but from now on, we can obviously start getting into more discovery videos, off-roading, doing more modifications, um, 
comparisons to defenders, things like that. It would be so much more to come now that we've got this this big obstacle of the gro broken gearbox out of the way. So a huge thank you to all of you for watching and also thanks to everyone that helped us make this possible as well as Ashcroft and uh, LOF Clutches as well for the uh, parts. And uh, we'll say thank you very much. We will see you in the next video.